wonderful singing choir. Good this morning just to know him, and especially during this time of year, we're reminded of the gift of God, the gift of Jesus, the gift of eternal life. I'm glad that I've accepted that gift. I, I pray this morning that you've accepted that gift. And if not, well, what better day than today to come to him and ask him to be your Savior. He's the Savior, but I want him to be your Savior. I mean, it's just good to know him. Uh, during the, the things of life that we face, it's good to have a friend that's promised us that he'd go with us all the way, even to the end of the world. I want to welcome you that are visiting with us this morning. You're much more than a visitor. You're a, a special guest. You're a guest at Batley, and we're glad that you've chosen this church to come out and worship with us uh, this morning. And uh, we're going to ask our ushers, if they'll come at this time, we're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Let's bow together as we pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, this Sunday, your day, the Lord's day, and for allowing us to gather together in this place. And Father, for this Christmas season, when all the world is reminded of your birth, I pray, Father, that this service, that everything that we do, may it point men and women, boys and girls, to the one that came to take away our sins. And Father, we pray that you'll bless, Lord, in the singing, you'll bless in the preaching. And Father, we pray this morning that we'll leave here refreshed and renewed. And Lord, willing to go out into a world that desperately needs to hear uh, that the good story, the good news that Jesus saves. Father, bless this offering. May we use it, Lord, so that your kingdom will be lifted up. Your name will be exalted. And Father, we'll be careful to praise you and thank you for it's in Jesus' name. I pray, amen. Would you stand and help the choir to sing as we receive the offering? His name is wonderful.
since then it's been privileged on been this great love story to tell
man, we, we could go home and say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Now, we're not going to do that. I think the Lord's still got some things that he wants to say to us, but the singing has just been wonderful to this morning. And, and the reason is, is because of the subject matter. It's about him. And whenever you sing about him, it's a good song. And I appreciate that. I appreciate everything that the Lord has done this morning. It certainly has blessed me. And I believe that all of us today, if we're honest, we'd have to say the Lord has been so good to me. And he has, no matter how bad things in life might get. God's grace has been sufficient. And we ought to be so thankful. We ought to put a smile on our face. It, it ought to put a skip in our walk. Just to be reminded that God is for us. Amen. Good today to be in the Lord's house. If you have your Bibles, we're looking in Luke chapter number 2. And uh, the afternoon schedule, for those of you that are involved in the uh, gifts for Jesus, that's in the bulletin. Be sure to get a bulletin and look at that. Uh, that'll be tonight at 6 o'clock. And I hope you'll come back and be with us. It's an exciting time. And, and our young folks, they get to give their gifts to Jesus. And uh, I'm glad that I, I'm here to witness that. I've been here every year. I reckon, I don't think I've missed any, but uh, every year's been good. I know we've got a lot of sickness, and a lot of our kids that had planned on being uh, a part of this, they're not able to because the flu is making its rounds. And, and uh, if you don't have it, you ought to be glad. And if you've, if you've gone through it, you ought to be thankful that you survived. And... Uh, God has been good to us. And also I want to make this announcement. After the service, we're going to give out our Christmas treats. We do that every year. I think we've got enough for everybody that's in here. But I would ask that you do this. It's all right to get one for somebody that's shut in. But would you wait until all the bags are given out so that we make sure we have enough to cover uh, what we've got here. We, we got extra this year. Uh, but with this kind of crowd, I, I just uh, worry about that. You know, I think we've got enough to cover it. And uh, after that's over, if you know somebody that's shut in, you feel free to come by and get a bag for them. But uh, if you'd wait till the end, while well, we'd appreciate that. Um, after the service, I need to meet with the deacons, the finance committee, and the treasurer. And we'll meet in the ladies' Sunday school class. I know you're going to give out the treats, and we'll give you time to do that. But we'll meet there just for a few minutes. I'm talking to you this morning about the birth of the Savior. Uh, let's stand as we look in God's Word and, and, and together. <coughs> it's good to have all three, <coughs> excuse me, all three of my sons with me. It's been a long time since we've been able to be in church together, all of us together, and, and I'm grateful for that. Beginning with verse 1, we'll read down through verse number 20. This is, this is the Christmas story. Now, don't confuse that with a fable. It's not a fable. It's a real story. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels, the multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go even into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. 
They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Mary kept all these things in her heart, kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard as it was told unto them. Father, we pray this morning that you'll use us, Father, for your glory. Help me to preach this message, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We're looking at the Christmas story, and, and I, I do love this time of year. I, I love all the bright clothes. and In fact, I, I believe that we ought to do this in January and February because uh, those are those drab months of the year. I mean, it gets so depressing and discouraging. And uh, I, I just think it'd be good to wear them until then. Not the same ones you got on right now, but uh, colorful clothes and, and just to uh, celebrate what God has done. But as we look at the birth of the Savior, I, I want to draw your attention, first of all, to the prophecy. You see, this had been prophesied for hundreds and hundreds of years, what took place on that first Christmas morning. The Bible says in verse 1, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And then in verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Now, at first glance, it would appear that Mary and, and Joseph were victims of a difficult circumstance. We find that Mary was great with child. It's hard for us to imagine the difficulties that they faced. You've got to understand that when they made that journey, that pilgrimage, there was no modern transportation in that day. It was either walking or on the back of a donkey or on the back of a camel. And keep in mind that from Nazareth to Bethlehem was over 70 miles. And it wasn't on a smooth path. It wasn't on level ground, but it went through mountainous terrain. There was robbers along the way. A lot of dangers along the way. And so to look at it from just eyes of humans, it would seem that what happened was just an unfortunate uh, set of circumstances. But this was no misfortune. This was all in the plan of God. God, back in the eons of time, had looked down through the corridors of time and he made the decision that the only way that we could be saved from our sins was for his son Jesus to come and give his life. And so it was in the mind of God, the plan of God. Caesar made the decree that all would go uh, to their city of their birth, uh, their ancestors, and, and they would be taxed there. Uh, and, and the Bible teaches us that that's what has happened. But you see, a sovereign God was working behind the scenes, and he, he was moving the mind of Caesar. And so Caesar was doing exactly what God was leading him to do. The prophecy of old records that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. I mean, it's a very obscure city. There, there was really nothing special about Bethlehem until Jesus came. The Bible uh, says in Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2, the prophecy was given, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephraim, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come unto me he... That is to be ruler in Israel whose goings have been of old from everlasting. And so Jesus came to this earth and he fulfilled every prophecy concerning his birth. You know, that ought to comfort us this morning. We think about that, that God will do what God says he will do. We serve a God that's in control of every aspect of our life. Nothing happens without the permission of God. He is sovereign, and I'm glad that He is. I, I, I'm glad that He's still in control, control. And so we see the prophecy. And then I want you to notice, secondly, the presentation. Verse 6 and 7. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. That's the presentation. Wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the end. 
these details and these verses uh, surrounding our Lord's birth, it tells us some things. Notice, first of all, the timing. The Bible talks about in the fullness of time, God sent His Son. The time was exactly right. Notice the timing. The Bible says in verse 6, when Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Now, that didn't surprise God. God already had that plan. The Bible says in the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. I mean, all creation yearned for this day. The Bible teaches us it was in prevail until that day. The world had anticipated the coming of the Messiah. Ever since that first prophecy given in Genesis chapter uh, 3 and verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed and thy seed. And it shall bruise thy head and, and bruise his heel. And so that first prophecy that was given is finally fulfilled. The fullness of God's timing had come and the Christ child was born. You know, we think about births. And I, I was telling Shauna this morning, we was watching uh, one of the uh, local programs, a church service, and they was having a baby dedication. And, and I said, we need to do that around Batley. Need to do that more often. I mean, we have them, but it's been a while. And, and I said every three months, I mean, I was anticipating uh, great births taking place around here. And she said, no, about every six months. But it's an exciting thing when a baby is born into this world. And think about the wonder and excitement of that. It's a miracle. God still performs miracle. I mean, that which begins so small that you can't even see it under a microscope. And then it's delivered a, a tiny baby. I tell you, if you've ever been there when a baby was born, you'll have to admit it's one of God's greatest miracles. Oh, we don't have an exact time for our Lord's birth, but He came just as God had promised. It was that moment that changed all humanity. It set in motion the wheels that would usher us to the old rugged cross the real reason that Jesus came was to bleed and die for our sins and to give his life as a gift to everyone that would receive it. Jesus came to provide salvation for the world. The King of glory came robed in human flesh. The Bible says his name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. God came to dwell among his creation. And so we've seen the timing and then... Something else that's important about this day was the clothing. Notice the clothing. The Bible says, when she brought forth her firstborn son, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Now, I know those are the clothes of one that's born in poverty, but it has a much greater significance than that. Swaddling clothes was just simply strips of cloth that was used in burials. And so even there at the cradle, we see the cross. God gives us a preview of the cross at his birth. He was wrapped in grave clothes. And then what about the manger? Jesus was placed in a manger that's literally a, a feeding trough. It's where the grain was placed. Feeding trough. The Bible teaches us that it's another promise that Jesus is going to fulfill. He came to feed those that are perishing in hunger because of their sins. Jesus identified himself as the bread of life. Listen to John chapter 6 and verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. And he that cometh unto me shall never hunger. Then in John 6 and 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man may eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then thirdly, I want you to notice his reception. All of this is taking place because the Bible says there was no room in the end. Joseph made his way to Bethlehem and didn't find any compassion. The king of glory was not born in a palace. He wasn't even born in a cheap motel room. He was born in a stable. And all the world was oblivious to his birth. They didn't even realize what was taking 
place. That was just the beginning of his reception on earth. He is despised and rejected of men. It began there at that stable. It continued all the way to the cross and it continues today. He is still despised and rejected of most men. That's his reception. Gave his life on the cross for those that despised him. For those that rejected him. And then thirdly, I want you to notice the proclamation. We have seen the prophecy. We've seen the proclamation. Uh, we, we've seen the... Uh, we have seen the presentation. But I want you to notice the proclamation. I want us to look in on that glorious moment. First of all, it was personal. And you've got to catch this this morning because it is so important. For unto you is born this day. Unto you is born this day. I'm glad that he said unto you. Because anybody could insert their name in the place of you and it fits. It's personal. He came to be a personal Savior. The angel declared that Christ was born unto them. He come to meet their needs. Now shepherds in that day were considered to be uh, of the lowest social class. They were despised. They were looked down upon. They were scorned. And yet it was to this group of unlikely hearers that the greatest news that the world has ever heard was first delivered to. The Savior had come, and he had come for them. I rejoice that I can know Jesus in a personal way, that he's not just some abstract, some obscure name that I've heard of, but it means nothing to me. I'm thankful that to me he's more than a Savior. He is my Savior. He is personal. Oh, the Savior come, he come for them. Came for you. He came for me. He came for everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And so it was personal. The the proclamation was, it was precise. I mean, there was no ambiguity. Uh, The Bible teaches us they revealed exactly where to find Jesus. He would be born in the city of David. Also, it's precise. He said, you'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. There's no doubt that the Lord had come and that the shepherds were directed to him. By the way, the hope still remains for this sin curse. Generation, I'm glad that he, the Holy Spirit, still directs men to Jesus. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. By grace, my fears relieved. I'm glad that he came to me one day and directed me to him that was able to take away all of my sins. It was precise. It's not a legend. It's not a fairy tale. It's real. He came to set the captives free. Oh, I rejoice that I've been pointed to Jesus, and I rejoice even more so that I've accepted him. My heart's desire, my prayer to God for you today is that you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Oh, dear friend, you can go through the life, and and you can do a lot of great things. But there's one thing that you better make sure that you get took care of. There better be a time in your life when you've surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and accepted Him as your Savior. And I'll guarantee you that everything else that you have done or will do, it'll pale in comparison to that moment that He comes into your heart and He becomes the Savior of your life. Oh, it was precise. Then it was profound. Once they made it to Bethlehem, they discovered a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, this is not an ordinary birth, and this is not an ordinary baby. I mean, He is unique. He is God in flesh. He's the Savior of the world. How the world needs to see Him in a profound way. Many will admit He's a great teacher. And some will even admit He's a great prophet. But he's much more than that. You need to see him in a profound way. He is the Savior of the world. 
He's God, the very God in flesh that came and dwelt among us so that we could behold his glory. Oh, he's more than a man that just showed compassion. He's not just a Lord. He's the Lord. He's not one among many. He's the only way. And then it was powerful. Verse 13 and 14. I love to hear the choir to sing this morning. And I thought I'd sure love to have been there on that first Christmas morning when that heavenly host sung. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Even heaven's host knew that something spectacular had happened. The king of glory had come to earth. So they praised him with glorious praise. They rejoiced in what God had done. It stirred their hearts. Angels that really didn't know anything about the new birth. And yet they was able to rejoice in knowing that God's plan had finally been fulfilled. Oh, dear friend, it's powerful. Nobody's ever changed the course of history like Jesus. A lot of great men have come through this land. I think about great uh, presidents. I thought about Abraham Lincoln, probably the greatest of all presidents. And he changed our world. He changed the United States in a profound way, a powerful way. But I tell you, dear friend, the way that he changed the world does not compare to the way way that uh, uh, that Jesus changed the world. Abraham Lincoln was able to set the slaves free. But I'm telling you this morning, Jesus was able to set all of us free from the bondage of sin, from the shackles that held us bound in, in, in that terrible condition that we was in. It was powerful, and we have the glorious privilege of knowing him. You ought to smile this morning. You ought to rejoice down in your heart that God has given you the privilege of knowing him. I don't know the governor of this state. I know his name, but I don't know him. I don't know our senators. I've never met our congressmen. I've never even met the mayor of Anderson County. I, I don't know those folks. But I know Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the King and Lord of my heart. I know him. And it's powerful because it changed my life. Nothing else could, but he did. And then notice the procession. Those that came to see Jesus. Notice the wisdom of the shepherds in verse 15 and 16. Came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. These men were unlearned. They were uneducated. I I thought about my dad. My dad had a second grade education. That's as far as he could go in school. My mama had a sixth grade education. But I tell you, they knew something that I wish the world knew. They knew Jesus as their personal Savior. Oh, I think about those disciples whom the world declared to be ignorant and unlearned men. But they took notice of one thing. They had been with Jesus. The wisdom. They didn't know much, but they understood enough to know that something miraculous and wonderful had taken place. So they wasted no time to go to worship Jesus. They didn't want to miss out on that experience. I don't want you to miss out on it. I don't want you to miss out on knowing him and being able to worship him. One of the greatest excitements of my life is to be able to come into his presence and just to bow my face before him and worship him. And you know the glorious thing about that is that it doesn't end when I leave this world. I'll just begin. If you want to find me 10,000 years from now, I'll tell you where you'll find me. You'll find me at the feet of Jesus, and I'll still be worshiping him. 
made it possible that somebody like me could be saved. I, I don't want you to miss out on that. It would be nice to look around while I'm on my knees before him and see that you're right there beside of me. That's my heart's desire, my prayer to God. I don't know much. I think about my life. There's a lot of things that I don't understand. But I do know this. On that good Friday, 1973, that revival meeting, something wonderful took place in my life that has changed me. I'm no longer the same. And so whatever happens, I'll guarantee you that that experience will be the strength of my life. It'll be what will carry me through the storms that might come my way. I can't explain it, but I rejoice in what I have in Him. So we've seen this morning. I want you to notice, secondly, the witness of the shepherds. And when they had seen it, this is key right here, they made known abroad. They couldn't keep it to themselves. Something happens that's exciting. You can't keep it to yourself. Even if it's something bad, but it's exciting. You come up on a wreck. What do you do? You get on your phone and you tell somebody, hey, there's a bad wreck over here in 61. It's not a good thing, but there is a sense of excitement and you want people to know. Your child is born. What do you do? Well, you put it in every newspaper. You get on the phone. It's on Facebook. It's, you got a Twitter account. You Twitter it. You blog it. You email it. Even send up smoke signals. <laughs> a baby is born. My child. It's exciting news, and you can't keep it to yourself. They couldn't keep it. And when they had seen it, they made, made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. They were reject, rejected by society, but they couldn't wait to tell society the good news. Oh, they told everybody that they encountered that Christ was born. I, I pray that in our hearts that it'll still stir that good news. Folks, it's just as real this morning if you're saved as it was that day that you were saved. It ought to stir us. It ought to put an excitement down in our soul. You know that Ezekiel talked about that wheel and a wheel. It ought to get the wheels churning down inside of you. Just to know that he is born, that God has come to live in our world, to bleed and die for our sins. Let's shout it. From the rooftops as the choir sings, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Well, it wasn't just the shepherds, though, that got excited. Don't you notice, last of all, the wonder of them all. Verse 18. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. It was such exciting news, people just couldn't hardly believe it. Could you, had you been there that day, a virgin has had a baby. Now that's real news. But the real news is this. The really real news is this. That it's not just that a virgin has had a baby. But a virgin has given birth to God. Folks, that's real news. And they wondered. The Bible says that Mary kept these things and pondered in her hearts. And the shepherds returned. Now listen, they did, they're still excited. They returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. They couldn't comprehend it. They couldn't explain it. But they told it something wonderful has happened. My desire for you is that you'll have the best Christmas that you've ever had. And if you make sure that it's not about things, you can have a glorious Christmas. It's not about things. 
A lot of folks this year, they're financially strapped. and This Christmas is going to be a whole lot leaner than Christmas has passed. But it's not about presents under a tree. I hope that you never lose sight of the wonder of it all. That it's about Him. That's what Christmas is all about. May we not get so caught up in the busyness and commercialism of Christmas that we fail to reflect on what it's all about. That's why we'll have communion tomorrow night. It's just a way to remember what he's done for us. It is his day, regardless of what we've done to this holiday, this holy day. It's still about him. So don't leave Christ out of Christmas. Make sure that you retain Him in these wonderful couple of days ahead of us. Let us pause and praise Him that He came for us. He didn't have to. He could have wrote off His creation because His creation had corrupted themselves with sin. And to be honest with you, If we look at it in an honest way, we weren't really worth saving. We had done nothing to earn such a gift as salvation. If we got what we deserved, we'd all be in hell this morning. There'd be no hope for us. But I want you to pause and reflect on what he's done for you. I know this too big for you. It's too big to be able to figure out, to comprehend it all. But let's just praise him anyhow. I trust you know Christ as your Savior. I feel strongly that there are some folks here today that don't know him. It would be very unusual for a crowd this big to have everybody saved. Not impossible, but it would be unusual. So I'm going to ask you this morning to invite Jesus into your heart to accept him as your personal Savior. And if this turns out to be the first Christmas that you've ever had that you've been saved, I can assure you it'll be the greatest Christmas that you've ever had. And for those of you that have lost the wonder of it all, things in life have caused you to stray from him, You didn't mean to get so far away, but you have. Today would be a good day to return to him. Say, Lord, I'm going to close out this year. I'm going to close it out by moving up to you, close to you, Lord. I just want to feel your presence. Connie's going to come and sing. We're going to have some folks that will gather on the front pews as she comes to help you. As we stand, as we sing. If you need to come and talk to the Lord, and if you're lost, you need to. If you're not in God's will, you need to come. I I know that we've got a big crowd, and it's awful intimidating sometimes, but if you could just muster up the courage to take that first step. I've discovered that when I take that first step, He helps me with the rest of them. And I'll guarantee you He'll meet you at the very point of your need. The Bible says, for with him nothing shall be impossible. No matter how difficult your situation is, no matter what a mess your life has got into, I'm glad that he's able to take broken pieces and he's able to rebuild lives and put pieces back together again. He's a wonderful Savior. I can highly recommend him. Somebody recommended him to me one day. And I stepped out on the recommendation that he'd be the greatest thing that could ever happen in my life. And boy, was they ever right. I could never repay those that recommended him to me, but I want to pass it on. And I want to recommend him to you. 
as we sing. Why don't you just slip out of your seat quickly and come and talk to him about whatever needs that you might have. If it's a burden, bring your burden to the Lord. As we sing, mind him this morning. He is here. I know there's others that need to come. I believe God's spoken to your heart this morning. You know down deep within that he's dealing with you right now. I wonder if you could just right now make up your mind. I, I'm not going to leave here defeated. I, I'm not going to leave here without the blessing that I know that God can give to me. I'm going to bring my cares to him. And I'm going to cast all of my cares upon him. Because I know that he cares for me. I wonder right now as we sing, while these are on the altar, I know there's others that need to come. Please lay aside any pride, lay aside any fear, and step out and come and claim what God offers you as we sing.